بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته <coughs> The recent events um, in, in Gaza, the genocide, the ethnic cleansing in Gaza has increased the interest in, uh, in the already interesting uh, and fascinating concept of the chosen people of God. Zionism, um, this supremacist ideology, is firmly based uh, on this concept. Uh, in fact, and also I may add here that uh, no supremacist ideology in, in modern times modern history has been so allowed and supported at this particularly uh, harmful ideology. Discussions of the concept uh, of uh, chosen people of God um, often conflate a number of different uh, concepts and this happens actually even when this concept is discussed in an Islamic context. In a, in a Quranic context. And the reason here is that the Quran has a large number of verses that deal with this concept kind of directly and indirectly. And it, it introduces a number of terms. In, in this video, my intention, inshallah, to try and um, analyze uh, what the Quran says about this concept and I hope that I will bring a new insight uh, into how this concept uh, is presented in the Quran as, and as I will show it is actually uh, uniquely described in the Quran in a unique way <clears throat> and I will be dealing with all these related concepts and discuss them um, and terms uh, to make the subject uh, as clear as I can. Um, and I will also, I have to say that I will have to, because this is uh, this video is, is targeted at um, English speaking uh, viewers, I will try to avoid uh, a kind of unnecessary discussion uh, of linguistic details. I will be given uh, the references to all verses and I'll be citing them in Arabic and in English so anybody who would like to pursue this further and go and check um, uh, references, details, translations it will be easy for them to do so um, and I will also be quoting uh, a relatively large, large number of verses and that's really necessary in order to develop and build a complete picture uh, of the concept of chosen people of God. Now, this video is actually a standalone video, uh, so in order to uh, watch it, you don't need uh, to refer to any previous video of mine. But it is also a sequel to a previous video which I did uh, on the Abrahamic Covenant. In that video, I introduced a new, uh, brought new insights. Uh, into how the Qur'an um, presents uh, and describes the covenant that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made uh, with Abraham. The Bible, the Hebrew Bible, makes Abraham's covenant um, effectively it extended, extends it to cover Israel. So his descendants, all of them from Isaac. The Quran does not do that. And um, I'll just to kind of quickly refer to the uh, main verse uh, that this, that talks about this covenant, um, which is Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. وَإِذِ ابْتَلَى إِبْرَاهِيمَ رَبُّهُ بِكَلِمَاتٍ فَأَتَمَّهُنْ قَالَ إِنِّي جَاعِلُكَ لِلنَّاسِ إِمَامًا قَالَ وَمِنْ ذُرِّيَّةِ قَالَ لَا يَنَالُ عَهْدِ الظَّالِمِينَ Which may be translated as and when Abraham was trialed by his Lord <clears throat> with his commands and he fulfilled them. He said, indeed, I will make you a leader for people. He said, and of my descendants, he said, that's Allah replying, uh, my 
covenant does not include the wrongdoers. So um, Sayyidina Ibrahim asked for the covenant to uh, include his descendants. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala confirmed that he will do that, but he also confirmed that it was, uh, this covenant will be restricted to, his, to those who are righteous. Now, the Abrahamic covenant um, and his chosenness was personal, individual. It was about him. Israel's was collective, not individual. So, no, it didn't, it wasn't a commitment, a covenant that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made with all of the nation of Israel. This is a very important point that uh, I explained in the previous previous video and we will um, develop this further here so this video will focus actually on this kind of collective chosenness of the Israelites and um, while most of the video will be um, discussing uh, the Quranic presentation of this concept uh, I will start actually by talking about uh, the Tanakh or the Hebrew Bible quickly, very quickly. And then at some point later, I will also review what Christianity says. Uh, that's just to put both of these in perspective and to make it easier for the viewer to compare what the Quran says uh, with these two uh, sources, um, the Hebrew Bible and Christian sources. So starting with uh, the Hebrew Bible, um, this covenant um, and the chosenness of um, Israel is mentioned actually in a number uh, of places throughout the Bible um, and um, we read about it, uh, we read that uh, uh, God chose uh, Israel, uh, the descendants of uh, Jacob, out of all people and uh, the Bible says uh, God chose them not because they were numerous in fact, they were the fewest of all peoples. That's what it says. And um, the Bible confirms that the, he chose them, chose the Israelites, because he loved them. There's no, actually, any more information as to why he chose them specifically. Just he loved them. And, um, and, and he promised as well, he promised them that he will make them numerous. And also, there is a lot of focus, of course, in the Hebrew Bible uh, on giving the Israelites the Holy Land. And, um, and also, the covenant uh, is said to be perpetual, so forever, it continues. And that's basically um, the foundation of the claim to the Holy Land, among other things. That has led, of course, to this genocide uh, and the previous uh, and the long history of genocide and ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians by Israel. Um, and then the, I should mention quickly that Judaism is not um, a proselytizing religion. It doesn't seek to spread its faith and attract other followers. Uh, so this, it's not proactive, even though conversion is accepted in Judaism. Uh, and there's, uh, there aren't really many places where you can see um, kind of um, a reference um, to Israel being uh, of, let's say, help and guidance to other nations because the focus is very much ethnocentric on uh, the relationship between God and, uh, and Israel, uh, the uh, Israelites. Uh, but there are uh, some few references, for instance, in I Isaiah um, and 46, uh, uh, 49 uh, verse 6, it says, I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. So there are kind of these uh, references, uh, but the, they are far from being uh, stressed and confirmed um, or stressed and repeated. The focus is very much on the, uh, uh, the race of Israel. However, because the Israelites, um, there were many prophets that appeared among the Israelites. This long line of prophets, prophets uh, resulted in a deep-rooted tradition, prophetic tradition, that made Israel, the nation, resilient. 
despite its small size, of course, and calamities. Uh, I think you can argue that um, this promise of making them numerous in the Hebrew Bible doesn't seem to have been fulfilled. They remained a small nation. And uh, uh, so, but that small nation still carried this prophetic uh, heritage, a uh, prophetic tradition. Uh, they maintained the message of the firmest, uh, affirmation of oneness, Tawheed, um, and, that, uh, and that's because of the uh, uh, number of um, prophets that uh, appeared among them uh, over the centuries. I, that's just as much as I would like to say really about the Hebrew Bible and what says here, because this is not just about as a background, it's not our main point. Uh, I should just mention quickly here that uh, recently in modern history, in particular after uh, the, um, Israel, the nation was founded, there has been uh, some over-focus on the success and good fortune uh, of, um, of the Israelites or the um, of the Jews uh, in recent history uh, and uh, this is usually um, and it's associated with the rise of Zionism and it's often seen by a lot of Christians and Jews as some kind of evidence and proof uh, of God's uh, of, of their chosenness by God and the promise etc and I just want to mention very quickly here that this argument ignores centuries of ill fortune and failures. They are overlooked, um, those, this long history, by those who make this point, this really ultimately political point, um, even though, of course, it's religious as well, about the success uh, of, the, uh, of the nation of Israel. So enough talking about the Bible. We might just refer to it quickly later on. I would like to move on to talk um, about the Quran, which is our main subject here. There are a number of concepts and terms in the Quran uh, that we, we, we will deal with um, that are relevant to the concept of the chosenness of the Israelites. Uh, the first is ikhtiyar, which means choosing. And the other concept is tafdil, or preferring. And the third is uh, ni'ma or favor. Uh, and then there's a term called ahd or covenant, and another called mithaq, which may be translated as contract, some would translate it as covenant as well. These different um, terms uh, mean different things. There are there's some overlap in meaning, but they are actually distinct and have different meanings. And these terms and concepts, they reflect, obviously, uh, represent different concepts, are often conflated even in Arabic interpretations of the concept of chosenness of the Israelites. Then when you move from Arabic to English discussions, the, the discussion becomes even more burdened by this conflation um, and uh, kind of mixing up of different concepts because and, and it becomes even more difficult actually for um, somebody who uh, watches or listen, listen who is watching or listening to something about the chosenness uh, of the Israelites in the Quran in English to even figure out how this uh, that there was some conflation or uh, mixing up um, because the translation hides that even further. So there's another layer uh, of obscuring, effectively, uh, what's going on there, the problem with mixing all these different concepts. In this video, I'll try my best uh, to always refer to the Arabic uh, term and concept, uh, and obviously its translation, uh, to, to, effect, to make it as clear as possible, to make the differences between these different terms as clear as possible. And that, and only that, will actually help us to kind of pin down what the Qur'an really, really means when it talks about the chosenness of the Israelites, and it does talk about that subject. So let's start. The first concept is or choosing and the verse 
that um, um, mentions this uh, concept, this term, is Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. وَلَقَدْ اِخْتَرْنَاهُمْ عَلَىٰ عِلْمٍ عَلَىٰ الْعَالَمِينَ We chose them with knowledge over the peoples, as in all peoples. That's one concept, that's اِخْتَرْنَاهُمْ That's, we chose them. Uh, the second is فَضَّلْ التَّفْضِيلْ or, or preferring. And that's about preferring the Israelites over other nations. The first one, اخترناهم, so uh, as in uh, uh, choosing, choosing them, selecting them from uh, other nations, or selecting them over, um, uh, uh, choosing them over other nations, selecting them from other nations. And the other is تفضيل, um, which is preferring them over other nations. So this is one example. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. يا بني إسرائيل اذكروا نعمة التي أنعمت عليكم وأني فضلتكم على العالمين. O children of Israel, remember my favor that I favored you and that I preferred you over the peoples. So you've got these two terms, تفضيل, um, uh, choosing, and preferring, these clearly are comparative, so they, they are used relative to other nations. And there's the term that also um, occurred in this verse called ni'ma or favor, that is general non-comparative. Now, as you would have uh, seen that both verses talk about uh, choosing, the, the first one choosing over uh, the Israelites over uh, other nations, all nations, and the other is uh, about um, preferring them over other nations. Now, the concept of all other nations is applies only to the time where this preferring, this choosing was applicable. This is not perpetual, this is not forever, as uh, uh, the Jews would say, um, the, the Hebrew Bible says. It is not, and I will show this as uh, later. Now, so the Quran says that Allah chose and preferred the Israelites. So, but what does that mean? What, what is that? Because this is ultimately what kind of the discussion, um, the differences are about. And here is my, let me give you first my conclusion, and then as we go along, I will explain and I will quote more and more verses to confirm and to show that this is the clear message of the Quran. This is what the Quran says about what it means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose the Israelites uh, and preferred them over other nations. The Israelites, what the Quran meant is that the Israelites were chosen to be the host people of prophets, the host people of prophets, the host nation amongst which prophets, prophets appeared, prophets were sent. That is really what uh, the Quran means when it says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose the Israelites over other nations or preferred the Israelites over other nations. Nation. Let me quote uh, one particular verse that's relevant um, to the subject to and analyze it um, to show how it really clearly differentiates, makes this point about the Israelites being a host nation. وَإِذْ قَالَ مُوسَى لِقَوْمِهِ يَا قَوْمِ اذْكُرُوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ إِذْ جَعَلَ فِيكُمْ أَنْبِيَاءَ وَجَعَلَكُمْ مُلُوكَ when Moses said to his people, O oh my people, remember the favor of Allah to you as he made among you prophets <clears throat> and made you kings and gave you what he never gave to any of the peoples. What he never gave to any of the peoples, the ending of the verse, is a reference to all 
these kind of favors put together. So it, it's not a reference to any some, something additional. It just it kind of sums up everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because it confirmed that this all together is, is really unique, these favors. <clears throat> so where I want to stop here is to how the verse distinguishes between um, the, the, how the prophets relate to the Israelites and how the kings relate to the Israelites. Remember, the prophets were Israelites. So they were descendants from <clears throat> the nation of Israel. And the kings, the same. These were um, Israelite kings. But when the Quran describes both of these, the prophets and the kings, it makes a very subtle difference yet, yet an extremely important difference. And it just shows the precision, the surgical precision of the language of the Quran. So let me repeat again how he described, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described both of these. He said, made among you prophets. So this um, clause differentiates between the Jews and the prophets in that the prophets were individuals as if they appeared kind of or, or sent to the Israelites. It doesn't treat them as just other Israelites. There's something special in the way they are described. Made among you. Made among you prophets. Um, in Arabic, جعل فيكم, جعل فيكم, Made amongst you prophets. But when it comes to describing the Israelite kings, it says, made you kings. So now there's no distinction between kings, the kings and their subjects the kings, the Israelite kings, and the other uh, Israelites. Why is that? Because the, the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here distinguishes this special status of being prophet from being a king. So a king uh, became a king because um, they are from that nation and somebody had to rule, etc. A prophet is not a function that is developed uh, in, in society uh, and then somebody is it promoted, whether he's, you know, he's chosen or he uh, take the position by force. It doesn't matter. It actually develops in a, in a, among people and by people. But prophethood is an appointment from God. This is why the Quran makes this distinction. Now, Look at that. Um, somebody may argue, say, well, uh, Allah said, made, made among you prophets. Of course, because not all the Israelites were prophets. Yeah, but why did he say made you kings? When he said made you kings, as in to say, I have actually given you uh, authority, giving you control, giving you um, governance, gave you power. That's what he means. So he's uh, effectively saying that this is my favor to all of you. I made you kings, so you actually governed yourself, you ruled yourself. <clears throat> Not forever, of course, but that's part of the favor that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to the Israelites. <clears throat> Whereas when it comes to the prophets, he only described them as uh, made amongst uh, the Israelites prophets. This is a very subtle and important, significant distinction. And what's really uh, telling here is when you go to the Bible, uh, you, a man um, kind of written book, you will see that it misses, it lacks this distinction. Uh, in fact, there is no interest in the prophets at all. The main focus is the kings. So for instance, um, the Bible says when at some point when God spoke to Abraham, Abraham, he told him, I will make you exceedingly fruitful and I will make nations of you and kings shall come from you. In another place, it says both of these are from Genesis. I will bless her. Uh, and this is about uh, Sarah. 
uh, Al Desha, uh, uh, Abraham's wife, and uh, she shall give rise to nations. Kings of, of people shall come from her. Again, um, look at the focus here, uh, the focus on um, kings. There's no mention of um, something equivalent to prophets, this is spiritual uh, status. That is what ultimately matters. Kings, every nation has kings. Prophet is the distinguishing factor of the Israelites. This dis description in the Hebrew Bible misses completely the whole point about the chosenness of Israel. Because it's, it is um, ethnocentric, it's, it's earthly, it focuses on this world, um, it's, it's completely misses the point. It has failed to retain and preserve the original word of God and the meaning uh, of chosenness of the Israelites. I may also add, this is just another example, another instance of the Quran not copying the Bible, but correcting it. The Quran is actually, um, I mean, some of you might have seen some of my videos or read some of my writings, is actually full of examples of correcting the Bible and correcting it in a very intelligent, at times subtle, at times very clear way. Uh, but what's amazing is how it avoids those errors in the Bible, including historical errors. But that's, that's, that's a different subject. So back to what I said earlier, the Allah choosing the Israelites really meant simply that he chose the Israelites to be the host nation, the host people of the prophets that he was going to send to people. So, um, and that obviously, this role, the role of hosting, being the host to these prophets, includes, um, as I said, Preserving the heritage, their heritage. What is their heritage? Their heritage is any scripture, wisdom, the law, the law as well. Um, all of this is part of uh, the function and the favor that uh, of the Israelites, the favor to the Israelites by God and the, by giving them this role, the role of hosting uh, prophets. This is one uh, another ayah that confirms what what we're talking about وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحُكْمَ وَالنُّبُوَّةِ وَرَزَقْنَاهُمْ مِنَ الطَّيِّبَاتِ وَفَضَّلْنَاهُمْ عَلَى الْعَالَمِينَ We gave the children of Israel the book, wisdom, and prophethood. We provided them with good things uh, and we preferred them over the peoples. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, the book, the concept of book here, also, of course, uh, encompasses uh, the concept of monotheism, uh, divine law, uh, ethical, co ethical code. So, um, as we call ibadat wa mu'amalat in Arabic, or um, uh, uh, worship uh, and transactions, uh, the way uh, people are supposed, required, commanded, to uh, deal with Allah and how to deal uh, with each other. Now, so the prophets, the whole point of choosing of them, the, the point of choosing Israel is so that meaning that they are going to be the host or they were uh, the host nation of the prophets. Um, now, let's say just um, some quickly what these prophets were, what, what did they share? The, 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 the identity uh, of these prophets, and they all had the same identity, the same faith, is what the Quran calls Islam. Islam, of course, is not only the religion of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu No, it's the, the, the description that the Quran gives to the one message, the one religion uh, of all the prophets that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent. Um, so they were all uh, Muslims and they all taught Islam, meaning surrender to Allah 
and uh, monotheism. So the Quran also confirms that the, those prophets were not Jews or Christian. And the reason uh, the Quran says that because the Quran distinguishes between uh, uh, those who are the Jews being a term that refer to uh, an ethnic uh, racial term and Christians because the Christians actually are polytheistic. This is, these are descriptions, of course, uh, the Quran contains uh, when, it, when it was revealed. So it's talking about the Christians and the Jews even then about their, um, how, why it distinguishes them from Islam, because Islam, or it's called Hanifism or Hanafiyya, um, monotheism, um, is, is perpetual. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, it's the religion that um, hasn't changed, the message hasn't changed, whereas Judaism and Christianity do not reflect not accurately uh, that message and the case is even more so of course in the case of Christianity uh, because it, uh, effectively because um, Jesus was turned into into a god <clears throat> so one verse there are many verses actually I could quote but one of them uh, says ما كان إبراهيم يهوديا ولا نصرانيا ولكن كان حنيفا مسلما وما كان من المشركين Abraham was neither, was ne neither a Jew nor a Christian, but he was a Hanif, Muslim, and he was not um, of the, one of the polytheists. Uh, the same is said about other prophets uh, in the Quran. They were not Jews or Christians. There's one thing that um, um, the Quran confirms and the Bible is that the Israelites sinned just like any other nation. They were no different. Um, they were, uh, they failed, they disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they were punished. Exactly the same descriptions that you find about any other nation. No distinction whatsoever here. That. And uh, among the failures that are mentioned in the Quran, there were some historical failures so that happened uh, before the Quran, including um, acts of a bit a disobedience um, of Moses, so they disobeyed uh, Moses. Uh, they worshipped uh, a, a calf. Uh, that was another example. Um, and obviously, at the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the Quran also documents other failures by the uh, Jews at the time, and these include concealing parts of the book, the scripture they had, uh, which would have given. Um, information they did not want to disclose, including things that would have confirmed the prophethood of Muhammad sallallahu um, Things also that the Quran criticized they were practicing at the time is the taking of usury and of course rejecting the prophethood of Muhammad But there's one particular sin, serious, really serious sin that the Quran mentions as particularly evil um, that um, the Israelites committed uh, and it's particularly evil because they were the, uh, uh, the, the chose, uh, chosen nation to host the prophets and that sin is the killing of prophets. So they were chosen to be the host people of prophets. Yet, the Qur'an mentions eight times the fact that they killed the Prophet. So it's so serious, that's actually repeated eight times in the Qur'an. And this is one verse um, that mentions this particular issue. لَقَدْ أَخَذْنَ مِيثَاقَ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ وَأَرْسَلْنَ إِلَيْهِمْ رُسُلًا كُلَّمَا جَاءَهُمْ رَسُولٌ بِمَا لَا تَهْوَ أَنفُسُهُمْ فَرِيقًا كَذَّبُوا وَفَرِيقًا يَقْتُلُونَ we took the covenant of the children of Israel and sent messengers to them. Whenever a messenger came to them with what their souls did not desire, they accused a group of lying and they killed another group. So, some messengers were just 
um, labeled liars, rejected, not accepted, because they told them what they did not like. They wanted the messengers to be confirming or telling them what they were hoping for. But obviously these messengers were uh, commissioned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to stress and confirm his message and commandments and teachings and effectively reform uh, what had gone wrong. And that's why they fell foul with the Israelites. So the Israelites, the reaction was that some messengers were uh, labeled liars, were rejected, and others were killed. Now, before um, <clears throat> somebody uh, runs um, and accuse the Quran of anti-Semitism because of that. Well, actually, this is mentioned in the New Testament as well by Paul. So Paul accused the Israelites of killing prophets. Indeed, Jesus himself in the New Testament is said to have criticized the scribes and Pharisees for this particular issue. Uh, so uh, Matthew reported that Jesus said, addressing these, you say, if we had lived in the days of our ancestors, we would not have taken part with them in shedding the blood, the blood of the prophets. So that Jesus is actually saying that. <clears throat> but where did Jesus get it from? Because it's actually mentioned even in the Tanakh, in the Hebrew Bible. So it's a well-known fact. And um, in the Hebrew Bible, uh, this is mentioned with certain individuals, certain prophets named, and also mentioned uh, in the plural, as in um, prophets were killed. And um, one um, place, or one quote that I would like to um, mention here is uh, from Elijah, the ninth century prophet. And he says, he's talking to God here, the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone I am left and they are seeking my life to take it away. Now, one interesting thing, I, I, I deliberately chose the, this particular quote and the verse before because they show us something that we may not see in other verses and other quotes from the Hebrew Bible. Elijah here makes a connection <clears throat> between uh, breaking the covenant and killing prophets. So he said, the Israelites have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. That connection is actually also found in the Quran. So the Quran says, فَبِمَا نَقْضِهِمْ مِيثَاقَهُمْ وَكُفْرِهِمْ بِآيَاتِ اللَّهِ وَقَتْلِهِمْ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ بِغَيْرِ حق. وقولهم قلوبنا غلف غلف بل طبع الله عليها بكفرهم فلا يؤمنون إلا قليلا. For their breaking their covenant, their disbelief in the signs of Allah, their killing of the prophets without right, and they are saying our hearts are covered, means our heart uh, are fine, are okay, and they have no spiritual diseases. Uh, protected. Rather, Allah has sealed them because of their disbelief. So they do not believe except for few. So um, the Jews, according to the Quran, according to the Bible, both the Hebrew Bible, the New Testament, the Jews repeatedly broke their covenant. So just to recap, the Quran confirms that the Israelites were preferred over other nations, were chosen over other nations. But what it means by that, by that preferring, by that choosing, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made them the host people of prophets. That's it. No more, no less. Then he said, the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran <coughs> that they, he chose them over all the peoples. Does this mean that this choosing is perpetual? Well, that's the, what the Hebrew Bible says. The Quran actually denies that, rejects that. Now, if you remember, if you, if you keep in mind that the chosenness is about this clear function, 
which is to host profits, then this becomes it becomes clear that this is not perpetual. The last prophet that was sent to the Israelites was Jesus, 2,000 years ago. Not only that, they actually tried to kill him. In this particular instance, they were unlucky from their point of view. Of course, uh, both Christians and Jews believe uh, the Jews of the time killed him. The Quran denies that. Obviously, another um, another instance instance that uh, nobody can kind of very um, ex impossible to explain why the Quran would deny something like that if it wanted to just basically go along with whatever beliefs uh, were widespread at the time and accepted and popular. Um, but that's again, that's a, a separate issue. I just want to mention it quickly. Uh, so um, remember that because of the long kind of centuries, long uh, line of prophets and centuries of prophets appearing in the Israelites, the Israelites, um, they maintained, became the custodian, uh, the custodians of prophetic tradition. Uh, heritage and that included monotheism um, the law um, um, some ethical values of course so they were the guardians but they were they were imperfect guardians that for sure according to their own book as well but they were the best available so of all the nations that were available you couldn't find guidance to Islam, as described in the Quran, anywhere as you would have found it in Israel. You would have gone there and you would have become the closer you could to the uh, prophetic tradition, the teachings of the Prophet. They had been distorted, changed, etc., but there was the core was still there and they were the best available. And of course, apart from Prophets, this environment, spiritual environment, meant that a lot of wise people, righteous men and women appeared throughout the history of the Israelites. And this also kind of helped in maintaining, preserving uh, that heritage that was for all people, for the benefits of all people. But, but that role, the, this particular unique role, ended when the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam was commissioned. The role of hosting prophets ended because he was not an Israelite. He was not from the uh, descendant of Jacob. He was descendant of Ishmael, uh, but was obviously Abrahamic still. So that means he was not hosted. He was not supported by the Israelites. So their hosting function ended there. And then, of course, as I said, the last prophet was, as we know, um, Jesus before then. After that, there was none. And furthermore, Prophet Muhammad is the last prophet. So there will be no renewal of this role of chosenness at some point in the future. So the Israelites cannot say, well, Muhammad وسلم, was a one-off, uh, but at some point, based on your own interpretation of what the Quran says, we will become again uh, the chosen, continue to be the chosen people of God because prophets, other prophets will appear. No, they will not because Muhammad وسلم, is the last prophet. Furthermore, I said that the chosenness was because of meant hosting uh, the prophets. And as a result of that, even when the prophets were no more, uh, the Israelites still had the unique role uh, of preserving the prophetic tradition. That also ended with the coming of Muhammad وسلم, because he brought a new book, a new book that corrected uh, what the Hebrew um, or the scriptures that um, the Israelites had um, corrected those, identified the places uh, that were changed, 
and uh, it's a, it's a new scripture that is unlike any scripture before it is described as a preserved preserved by Allah so it will continue to the end of time now where is there any chosenness left of course none and nothing because there will be no new prophet who could appear among the Israelites the Jews meaning uh, that's not going to happen because there will there will be no prophet and there will be no book no new revelation um, and uh, so there's no heritage prophetic heritage for them um, left uh, left for them to uh, maintain and preserve the Quran brought or the uh, uh, prophethood of Muhammad in, in the form of the Quran brought scripture that is far far superior uh, to anything that existed before it um, of course uh, you know anybody can uh, read about the history of the Bible this is not the Hebrew Bible and indeed uh, the New Testament this is not the place to discuss that and to see the human uh, history of uh, these books um, a book by I think I would recommend by John Barton is an excellent book and um, writings by uh, Ehrman um, it, Professor Ehrman is uh, uh, also fantastic uh, excellent writings um, and uh, fantastic references on this subject uh, and there are obviously numerous books but the point I'm making is that the fact that uh, the um, uh, Hebrew Bible and the Christian Bible uh, Christian New Testament uh, are written uh, have by uh, people of a centuries edited and re-edited and changed and etc all of that there's nothing to do with the Quran there's not an Islamic claim all all that all it is is that the Quran says something 14 14 centuries ago that only about two three centuries ago uh, the West uh, Christians uh, and Jews started to realize and accept and concede that's all to it really so this is not the Quran making that claim but that's that's a separate point so moving on um, there's one particular verse that I would like to mention here that confirms uh, the fact that the Quran now is the reference is the divine book uh, and that it's superior uh, to whatever was existed before it because it uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes it as being مُصَدِّقًا لِمَا بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ مِنَ الْكِتَابِ وَمُهَيْمِنًا عَلَيْهِ Confirming that which preceded it of the book so confirming the main messages uh, anything that's right that was preserved in the whether the Hebrew Bible or anything that existed in scripture uh, before it that uh, that that is uh, correct uh, that was uh, genuine authentic so it confirms that but it also goes on the Quran goes and says and wa muhaymin muhaymin means has authority over um, superior to it so that's why the Quran has effectively ended the function of the books uh, that existed before it you don't need the, need those books even if um, there were um, let's say texts sources that contain contain a lot of authentic revelation from the past at the time of Muhammad وسلم, when the Quran came nobody would need those anymore now people who had those books or any form of scripture would still have needed the Quran because the Quran corrected things added clarified and it's a book that was not tampered with was not corrupted was not changed by a human hand unlike anything that existed at the time of course the Quran also introduced a new law so we call Sharia it's a new law um, and um, it made it clear that the failure to accept Muhammad is a failure to discharge one's duty even according to the established 
scripture, the older scripture. And I would like to mention here one particular prayer by, by um, Abraham, Sayyidina Ibrahim, when he was in Mecca. This is, of course, from the Quran, and uh, this episode of Abraham living in Mecca is completely missing from the Bible. Some of that's part of the history that the Bible has uh, was removed from whether it was in whatever form in the in, in their writings, the Jewish writings. So the verse goes uh, as follows. رَبَّنَا وَبْعَثْ فِيهِمْ رَسُولًا مِّنْهُمْ يَتْلُ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِكَ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةَ وَيُعَلِّمُهُمُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةَ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ الْعَزِيزُ الْحَكِيمُ O Lord, and send among them a messenger from themselves who will recite to them your verses, teach them the book and wisdom, and purify them. Indeed, you are the mighty, the wise. What's interesting here is that um, when Abraham made this prayer, he was in Mecca and he was talking and thinking of his son Ishmael, not Isaac. So this is very important, very significant. So Abraham did not have this concept that all prophets uh, had to come from Isaac. No. He was, um, uh, he thought that he wanted actually a messenger, a prophet uh, to come from the, uh, from his son Ishmael. So that kind of um, exclusiveness to prophethood uh, that uh, is claimed um, by, in, in the Hebrew Bible or by the Jews is actually completely and utterly incorrect. Uh, Ishmael also was a prophet himself and uh, his descendant Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam of course uh, was a prophet and uh, this prayer the Abrahamic prayer for a messenger to be sent to the Meccans to the people there is actually confirmed <coughs> confirmed in another verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers indirectly to the Abrahamic prayer as he says كَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا فِيكُمْ رَسُولًا مِنْكُمْ يَتْلُوا عَلَيْكُمْ آيَاتِنَا وَيُزَكِّيكُمْ وَيُعَلِّمُكُمْ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحِكْمَةَ وَيُعَلِّمُكُمْ مَا لَمْ تَكُونُوا تَعْلَمُونَ As we sent among you a messenger from yourselves who recites to you our verses, purifies you, teaches you the book and wisdom, and teaches you what you did not know. So, the, this verse uh, is effectively uh, says, refers to the confirmation of the uh, Abrahamic uh, prayer for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send um, uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send the prophet uh, in, to that area from uh, among the people there and that meant Ishmael from his descendants. What this tells us is that the chosenness or the preferring of the Israelites over all other people was a past event. Something happened in the past, lasted for centuries, that's for sure. It was for a long time, but it did end. It ended completely with the uh, coming of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. Now, what even, what's even uh, kind of um, worse is that this concept of chosenness was mistaken. So the function of hosting uh, the prophets was mistaken for being the best nation. And this is another distinction that the Quran makes very very clear i'll get to later but i want to stress here how important another really really fundamental point to understand chosenness in the quran uh, of the israelites does not mean chosenness for to be the best nation only chosen to host the prophets and uh, consequently to preserve their 
heritage. That's what it means. Uh, not as the uh, um, Jews would say, uh, they are the best nation. The best nation isn't, that's not what it means to be best nation. I'll explain later. <clears throat> of course, everything I've spoken about now, so far, about the mis misunderstanding that we've seen uh, in the Hebrew Bible or misrepresentation of the concept of chosenness is actually shared by Christians because the Christians, uh, Christians accept the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, or they call it the Old Testament, because they accept it, they have uh, effectively inherited, uh, they have taken over, shared that misunderstanding of the meaning of the chosenness of the Israelites. But yet not to be uh, outdone, the, Israel, the Christians then came up with their own version of chosenness, um, being best, they mean by that they are best, and applied it to, guess what, themselves. So how did this happen? So let's talk a little bit about Christianity now. Won't spend a lot of time, just quickly. And the Christians introduced something called replacement theology. Or also it's known as uh, supersessionism. Supersessionism from supersede. And this is uh, the concept that the, uh, the, the New Testament church, that's the Christian community, is the new Israel, the new chosen people. So this particular uh, theology view uh, was accepted by most Christians uh, for over most of history. And uh, at times uh, described as the spiritual Israel, so uh, replacing the uh, ethnic Israel. So the Israel of the Old Testament is ethnic, as we all know, but the, then they would call themselves, so they borrow the term Israel, but described as spiritual. So they are the spiritual Israel. Why are they keen on it? Because chosenness for them means best. Chosen means best. Another misunderstanding. But we'll get to this, like I say, later. Um, one particular um, book that often, that's often uh, quoted to support this theology is Hebrews, uh, when it quotes uh, uh, Jeremiah, of one of the prophets of the Hebrew Bible, saying, I will make, talking about God here, God speaking, I will make a new covenant with the house, with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And the Christians then said, well, that is our new covenant. And that replaced the covenant that God had with Israel. That was old. Um, now, obviously, one problem with the quote of Jeremiah, which I actually spoken about quickly in another previous video, is that it is still Israel focused. Why would it use the name Israel, um, uh, Judah, if it was a spiritual covenant? It's not clear. Um, it's talking about new covenant, but unfortunately uh, mentioning the same old ethnicity. Um, I should also mention that those who reject um, uh, replacement theology, um, they, um, uh, they, they often quote Paul, uh, Romans 9 to 11, uh, where clearly uh, Paul thinks that um, God did not exclude Israel, the nation, completely uh, after Jesus. At times you come across uh, the a term, uh, the term fulfillment theology. Uh, this is uh, um, often kind of included in superstitionism. Uh, so superstitionism is kind of um, often looked at a replacement, in particular as um, uh, offensive. Um, so, um, so this is why uh, some scholars. Uh, people prefer to use uh, fulfillment theology. Fulfillment means um, uh, Israel uh, picture of the true people of God was fulfilled in the church. So this kind of implies or concedes that Israel's picture in the uh, Hebrew Bible is clearly nowhere near best nation, nowhere near perfect. Uh, but, uh, but the 
Christians then said, okay, uh, we, um, that kind of perfect picture was fulfilled in the church. Well, the question is, is the history of Christians and Christianity is any better? That's the question. Um, Supersessionism um, kind of is, it comes in more than one flavor. So why, in terms of why, why it happened, why the Jews were replaced, uh, there's the kind of one form is usually described as punitive, if you like, and that's because, meaning the Israelites were replaced because they rejected the Messiah. Among the people who spoke uh, about this is Origen, um, of course, who died in the middle of the third century, and Martin Luther, who died in the middle of the 16th century. A punitive because they rejected the Messiah. Another one is called, a kind of described as economic. This is God's plan. God's plan was to use an ethnic group and then to move on to use a non-ethnic group. Um, uh, and that one of the people who adopted this view was uh, Meleto of Sardis, who died around 180 or so. Um, replacement theology, or uh, uh, um, supersessionism, uh, does not believe in the restoration of Israel, as in the re-establishment of the state of Israel. They, that, this, because they don't, they are not needed. The Israelites are not actually needed in this theology, replacement theology. <clears throat> but some uh, supersessionists uh, super believe in the salvation of Israel. So Israel will not be restored as a nation to its previous glory, but Israel as a nation will be uh, uh, kind of uh, saved uh, by being incorporated into the Christian church. So that was the uh, replacement theology or uh, supersessionism, uh, which, like I say, was the main theology for most of the history. But then we move on to something called dispensationalism. The, this is the new theology, if you like. Um, um, this is the father of this concept, is, uh, is a Bible teacher um, known as, uh, his, his name is uh, John Nelson Darby. He died in 1882. Um, and he, his concept, is, his kind of idea, was made um, popular and uh, solidified, if you like, in the um, um, strengthened uh, dispensationalism in the U.S. by uh, Cyrus uh, Schofield, uh, in, 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 who died in the early 20s, uh, in his Schofield reference Bible. According to dispensationalism, um, the uh, uh, history is, is divided into seven distinct dispensations or administrations. Uh, and um, that this particular uh, theology uh, strengthened um, uh, Christian uh, uh, Zionism. It's now uh, very popular and uh, widespread. It believes in Israel, basically, in the restoration of Israel, and it 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 kind of is founded. It's a it's a it's a cornerstone concept uh, in that theology. Um, so this is actually the theology that, as I said, is linked directly to Christian Zionism um, and um, uh, partly responsible uh, for the ongoing genocide and ethnic cleansing in, in Palestine. Supersessionism and dispensationalism are both based on the same misunderstanding of mistaking chosen for better and the so the jews mis, um, mistook their chosenness for being best the best nation and the christians rushed to dispossess them uh, of this misunderstanding or borrow it from them to own it themselves um, so, Christi Christianity's claim that, that the church, the New Testament church, is the chosen 
um, that chosen kind of um, um, n nation, if you like, <clears throat> that's superstitionism, um, or a chosen, so a chosen nation, that dispensationalism, because uh, dispensationalism allows for the continuation of the chosenness of Israel, is a misunderstanding of the chosenness of Israel, as I explained. Uh, Christianity uh, was no host for prophets. It's actually Paul's, not Jesus' teachings anyway. It's not even monotheistic. Um, it doesn't follow the Mosaic law, or it has its own law. The one term that used and abused and overused is love. That's all you get when trying to work out what Christianity is ultimately is about. And it also it has this eternal conflict and tension between it and between Judaism, because on the one hand, it relies uh, uh, completely on the Old Testament. On the other, it has to reinterpret, reject parts of the Old Testament, well, reinterpret in particular way. Um, to 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 suit its its end. So the Bible, as I mentioned earlier, it itself reject a kind of conflating or uh, chosenness uh, or chosen people uh, with best nation. <clears throat> For instance, the Judaism uh, accept conversion. A lot of people, you know, not large number, but some people convert to <clears throat> Judaism. Well, so I, what's that? I mean, they are not Israelites, of course, but they still become part of the people, uh, of the, you know, Jews. Um, uh, and, and some people, uh, and these, some of these converts, of course, um, um, are not um, Israelites or Ger, as they call them. Um, of course, Christianity, as I mentioned, also equates chosen to best, uh, but it's, in this case, it's not racial, uh, uh, unlike uh, what you find in the, in the Hebrew Bible. Both are wrong. Now, let me quote a verse here uh, that uh, makes no distinction, actually, uh, between the Israelites and other people. وقالت اليهود والنصارى نحن أبناء الله وأحباؤه قل فلما يعذب يعذبكم بذنوبكم بل أنتم بشر ممن خلق يغفر لمن يشاء ويعذب من يشاء والله ملك السماوات والأرض وما بينهما وإليه المصير The Jews and the Christians say we are the children of Allah and his beloved say then why does he punish you for your sins rather you are human beings from among those uh, he has created, he forgives whom he wills, and he punishes whom he wills. So the chosenness, uh, choosing Israel, was not an unconditional commitment by Allah. And as this verse shows, if you look at the history of the Israelites or the Christians, you can't distinguish them in terms of, um, from other nations, in terms of, they they made they disobeyed, uh, they disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa taala. They they committed sins. They were punished. They were, you actually cannot find a distinction between how they behaved and treated uh, as opposed to other people. Yes, a lot more of them, of course, among them were good people, righteous people. But as a nation, as a whole people, they were no different. So they cannot all describe collectively with one particularly positive term like they try to say نحن أحباء الله وأبناؤه أبناء الله وأحباؤه we are uh, the children uh, of Allah and his beloved no they were not and they are not the children of Allah or his beloved and the Bible, of course, has this kind of unresolved tension between presenting chosenness and, as meaning best and between the punishment and the long history of calamities. The, 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 the Jews, actually, 
faced throughout their, their history. The best nation, on the other hand, is, is, effect, is, is those who follow the prophets. That is the best nation. But that was not the behave, behavior of most of Israel. I mean, as we've seen, even the prophets were killed. Uh, those who obey, obey Allah uh, are saved and the rest are not. And there is no distinguishing or discrimination by race or any other attribute. In other words, another way of putting it, a righteous, a righteous or evil Israelite or Jew is no more so than a non-Israelite or a non-Jew. There's no difference. If somebody is an Arab or a Muslim and calls himself or, you know, a Muslim but behaves against Islam in a way that's completely an Islamic, in an evil way, well, he's an evil person. Even if he was an Arab from descendant of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or he was um, uh, whatever he would call himself. And according to the Quran, according to Islam, he's an evil, evil person. It doesn't matter. Nothing else would change this. Uh, description, uh, this uh, assessment of him. The Israelites, again, the, another kind of um, point to stress, choosing the Isra Israelites was not a goal itself. It was a means. It was just a method, a way in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala established an environment to send prophets so that he can spread his message and for that message to be carried from one century to another uh, and not to be lost completely. Some of it was lost, but not completely. Like I say, uh, they continued, they, they, the Israelites, the Jews continued to be there uh, as a source of guidance. And that's mainly also because a lot of righteous, wise, good people appeared uh, among the uh, Jewish people, among the Israelites, or, or in general, Jew, the Jew, Jewish people. Um, over the years, over the centuries. So the chosenness of the Israelites, Israelites was uh, uh, a means, not the goal. The goal for everyone was, is, and will always be the same, which is to become a member of the best, best nation. So what is the best nation? In the Quran, the best nation is mentioned, but it's never described in a tribal way, or in a racial way. It's not described as those who are Arabs or Hashemite, as in from Bani Hashim, uh, the clan of the Prophet Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam. It, it just is not described in any racial way. And remember, the Quran was revealed in an environment that was completely based a tribal environment. You would think a human being, if it was written by a human being, uh, would have said, would have linked it to the Prophet وسلم, his lineage, etc., and his clan. No, that's not what the best nation is in the Quran. Blood connection is completely irrelevant. Faith connection is what matters. The best nation in the Quran, this concept, is about sharing those values. Uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed and commanded people to follow and to embrace and to practice them, to act them out. So for instance, there are a number of verses, I can't mention them all, but Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat linnas ta'amuruna bil ma'rufi wa tanhawna anil munkar wa tu'minuna billah wa law amana ahlu al-kitab lakana khayran lahum minhum al-mu'minun wa akhtharuhum al-fasiqun Listen to the description of the best. You are the best nation produced for man mankind, enjoining what is right and forbidding what is wrong, and believing in Allah. If the end of the book had believed, it would have been better for them. Among them are believers, but most of them are disobedient. So, as you can see, it's not an exclusive uh, club. It's not an exclusive racial, ethnic, some ethnicity. No, it's based on being 
uh, on following Allah's commandments, living the way He ordered us to live. Anybody who does that can become and will become a member of the best nation. Khayra Ummah, Ummah nation. Khayra Ummah, best nation. Just an example from the Quran as well to show that anybody can join uh, the best nation by following the messenger. Messenger. Um, this this verse, an example. وَمِنْ قَوْمِ مُوسَىٰ أُمَّةٌ يَهْدُونَ بِالْحَقِّ وَبِهِ يَعْدِلُونَ Talking about followers of Moses. Among the people of Moses is a nation that guides by truth and by it establishes justice. Why would the Quran mention that? If it was as ethnocentric as the Bible, it could have been if it was man-made, man-written. But look at that. It's completely, completely disinterested in the ethnicity and the race of people. It's focusing on what they believe and how they work and how they uh, behave. Best nation, the best nation is actually a very important concept, is one in the same nation throughout history, just like Islam. The best nation is the nation of Islam. Oh, I don't mean the nation of Islam, of course. Uh, the name has other connotations. Uh, but uh, the, the nation of Muslims, those Muslims form what the Quran refers to as the best nation, Khayr Ummah. And those Muslims are not only the followers of Muhammad sallallahu Everybody who followed the messages the, of the prophets over the centuries are members of the best nation. This is why they are all one nation, but this nation extends over the centuries from the beginning of time to the end of time. And that's exactly uh, what the Quran here confirms. Like Islam itself, like the message itself. The message itself is the same message. The followers of this message are the same ummah. That the ummah that, that matters, best nation. Khayr ummah. <clears throat> this is confirmed in another ayah. In هَذِهِ أُمَّتُكُمْ أُمَّةٌ وَاحِدًا وَأَنَا رَبُّكُمْ فَاعْبُدُونَ Indeed, this is your nation, one nation, and I, I am your Lord, so worship me. This is your nation, one nation, and I am your Lord, so worship me. This, this verse is actually occurs after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had recounted the stories of, of a number of prophets, uh, prophets that uh, came over, you know, a long period of time. So after talking kind of briefly about the stories of these prophets, it concludes with, Indeed, this is your nation, one nation, and I am your Lord, so worship me. Beautiful, beautiful, consistent, no bias there, no racial discrimination, no tribal discrimination, no discrimination of any form, social, otherwise, nothing, nothing. It's about faith and the deeds, the good deeds uh, required, stipulated by that faith, period. If you follow that, if you do that, you're a member of that nation and you will be a member of the same group of people that lived with Moses and followed him that lived with Abraham and followed them. And this is exactly why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ أَوْلَى النَّاسَ بِإِبْرَاهِيمَ لَلَّذِينَ اتَّبَعُوهُ وَهَذَا النَّبِيُّ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَاللَّهُ وَلِيُّ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Indeed, the people who have the best, the best claim to Abraham are those who followed him. And this prophet and those who believe, Allah is the ally of the believers. Just look at that. That's why it's one nation. That's why it says the closest, the best claim to Abraham, not the Jews at the time of Muhammad who rejected him or anybody who rejects any prophet. Because in the Quran, of course, all the prophets confirmed over and over again that must not, we must not dis kind of differentiate and say, I follow this, I don't follow that. It doesn't make sense in the Quran because it's the same message. Is the same sender, and they're all sent with the same teachings. 
to recap on this kind of discussion, this section, uh, I would like to quote this verse. Um, it's very, it's quoted um, in, in discussions about how the Quran is, uh, is, is, is kind of treats people equally. إنا أخلقناكم من ذكر وأنثى وجعلناكم شعوبا وقبائل لتعارفوا إن أكرمكم عند الله أتقاكم إن الله عليم خبير Indeed, we have created you from male and female and made you peoples and tribes that you may know one another. Indeed, the most noble of, of you in the sight of Allah is the most righteous of you. Just look at simple consistent that consistency clarity and convincing message is missing from the bible you don't find it there the same applies to christian uh, the christian scripture where you see tension throughout and you're trying to patching up here and there all the time that what most um, jewish and christian theologians are actually involved in a lot of the time now Having discussed the concept of اختيار uh, خير best اختيار uh, 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 sorry choosing uh, and uh, uh, preferring تفضيل and uh, نعمة فضل there are two other terms that I would like to mention quickly and I'm gonna make sure I avoid getting into any linguistic details because it can get a bit complex so the terms that I'm talking about are ahd Ahd, which is usually translated as covenant, and Mithaq, which may be translated as contract. Um, covenant with Israel, Allah's covenant with Israel was still, still uh, valid at the time uh, of the Prophet Muhammad. That means it is not the same, it has does not have the same meaning as choosing and preferring because we said that ended with Muhammad when Muhammad became prophet. There is no hosting of prophets, no uh, preserving of prophetic heritage. That was not anymore the function of Israel. Yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the time the prophet still talks about the covenant, asking, demanding that the Israelites, the Jews, um, could deliver on this covenant. This is one ayah. Ya Bani Israel, اذكروا نعمتي التي أنعمت عليكم وأوفوا بعهدي أوفي بعهدكم وإياي فرهبون All children of Israel, remember my favor that I favored you and fulfill my covenant so I fulfill your covenant and be afraid of me. What, what is that covenant? So it's not, the, the nothing to do with the chosenness. Remember what I've just said. Chosenness is a completely different concept. In Christianity, these are conflated. In Judaism, they are conflated. They are talked about as if they are one and the same. In the Quran, the Quran unpicks this confusion and conflation and takes us back to the origin of this concept and the reality of what they are. So what is this covenant? The covenant Allah subhanahu wa is talking about, it involves an, a number of, of kind of um, commandments that he ordered the Israelites through the prophets that came to them over the centuries. For instance, in one, one aspect, and the, the, the details of this covenant actually occurs in a number of verses in the Quran, but I'm going to kind of uh, quote um, some of these uh, verses or um, kind of parts of these verses. Take what we have given you firmly and listen. So, meaning uh, talking about the scripture here the book as in follow it firmly and listen listen to what it tells you to what it says and implement uh, do what it forces you or tells you to do and in another verse again Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes another aspect of the ahd covenant he's talking about when he addresses the Israelites لا تبينن, لا للناس ولا تكتمونه you must make it clear to the people and not conceal it. It's talking about the Israelites who actually concealed some of the scripture, would not want to share them with others uh, because they can then think that probably uh, they would not uh, can kind of um, exp 
expose some of their behavior, some of their uh, the way they lived, and also uh, things that could have uh, would have supported the prophethood of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So that's another uh, aspect of the uh, of the covenant. But let's look at another verse that gives even more details. وَإِذْ أَخَذْنَ مِيثَاقَ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ which means, and when, when we took the covenant from the children of Israel. So what is that covenant? لا تعبدون إلا الله وبالوالدين إحسانا وذي القرب واليتام والمساكين وقولوا للناس حسنا وأقيموا الصلاة وآتوا الزكاة. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when we took the covenant from the children of Israel that do not worship except Allah. Do not uh, do good to parents and to relatives, orphans, and the needy. Speak to people good words, establish prayer, and pay alms. This verse clearly defines in more detail what is included in the covenant with the Israelites. This is why uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the time of the Prophet sallallahu wa still reminded the Israelites of the covenant. They were not chosen anymore. But the covenant was still there because it's the covenant that uh, it's a commitment. It's what he asked them to do when the uh, prophets uh, came to them. And this is covenant, this particular is particularly important because to reject um, um, one aspect of this covenant is actually to support the prophets. Now, we know they killed some of them and denied the, denied the prophethood of others. In one ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the covenant with Israel as meaning, وَآمَنْتُمْ بِرُسُلِي وَعَزَّرْتُمُهُمْ You believe in my messengers and support them. So, to reject the prophethood of Muhammad means to break the covenant that the Israelites had with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And... As you can see here, um, and as you know from history, um, the Israelite, the, the history of the Israelites is, is full of um, repeated instances and acts of disobedience. Um, and uh, so chosenness, uh, the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose them uh, to become the host uh, of, for the Prophet and to preserve uh, the prophetic heritage until the Prophet Muhammad appeared. Is no, was no guarantee um, uh, or, or was no, no con unconditional commitment by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, to, uh, to, to the Israelites. Only if they followed through on the te those teachings, implementing them, any one of them would be one of the best nations. So they move from being a member of the chosen people to the goal, which is to become a member of the best nation. Um, so there's one verse I would like finally to mention, which talks about, again, describes the Ahd Allah, the covenant of Allah, as being actually general. So one verse says, the الَّذِينَ يُوفُونَ بِعَهْدِ اللَّهِ وَلَا يَنْقُضُونَ الْمِيثَاقِ Those who fulfill the covenant of Allah and do not break the contract. This is actually mentioned not in the context of talking of the Israel. So as you can see, the concept of Ahd Allah being the commitments that are, uh, that that what kind of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the demands Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, has from us in terms of beliefs and behaviors are called Ahd Allah. So when Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam was uh, uh, received the Quran uh, and the message, those who followed him have now a ahd ma Allah. They have a covenant ma Allah. It's nothing to do. This doesn't make them any better. Any anything. Just have that ahd. Only if they follow through, and if they abide by the uh, commandments, follow them, follow everything that was revealed and required of them, they become the best members of the best nation. Uh, so that is, um, and as you can see here, there's no, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not talk um, uh, about the Muslims uh, as being chosen in the way it, um, uh, the Quran referred to the 
Israelites, or uh, it doesn't talk about, uh, I should say, the the people uh, of, let's say, Quraysh or, or Bani Hashim, or the tribes uh, in which that the, to which the Prophet وسلم, belonged, are not described. These tribes are not described anywhere as being chosen, because like I mentioned, chosenness is a completely different concept. So, um, I think I've come um, to the end uh, of what I wanted to discuss here. Uh, but uh, let me just recap, just a quick uh, summary. The concept of uh, chosenness um, in the Tanakh, in the Hebrew Bible, uh, is, a, um, uh, is ethnocentric, is, 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 is racial, is based on a race. Also, it is equated uh, to best, so chosen is equated to best, uh, despite the obvious tension of repeat disobedience and punishment from Allah, repeat, repeat dis disobedience by the Israelites and repeat punishment uh, by Allah uh, for that dis uh, uh, obedient, obedience. Uh, the Quran, the Quran on, on the other hand, uh, uses different, uh, has a number of different terms and concepts uh, that are often conflated. Um, and um, um, what I tried to present here, as I said, um, this is um, um, try to uh, bring in a new, new insight into what the Quran says, what it really means by uh, chosenness. Chosenness is a historical role that the Israelites had, had, they don't have anymore. Uh, and that was uh, hosting uh, Muslim prophets. Um, Israel, for centuries, was the only, uh, albeit imperfect, carrier of prophetic tradition, including uh, monotheism, uh, the law, um, um, ethnic, uh, um, sorry, uh, ethical values, and so on. But that ho that role of hosting prophets uh, prophets ended when the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu taala alaihi wasallam was sent. Um, so, the Muhammad was non-Israelite. Uh, he was um, um, he did not the 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 uh, the, the revelation uh, that he was given is better and the best because it's preserved and it's lasting. It's not going to go away and it will not change forever. Christianity, on the other hand, inherited um, this Jewish kind of the Jewish misunderstanding of chosenness, which is why it ended up with um, inventing uh, theologies such as uh, replacement theology uh, and um, dispensationalism. As for the concept of best nation, best nation is simply a term in the Quran that describes the followers of the prophets, the Muslim prophets. All Muslims throughout history are members uh, of the best nation. That's what the best nation is. The followers of Moses, those who followed him truly, those who followed Abraham, Jacob, Noah, Muhammad وسلم, everybody. It's based on piety and it's open to all without discrimination whatsoever. Uh, and I've also kind of um, also touched quickly on, uh, 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 on other terms, such as um, Ahd covenant, um, um, kind of, and, and uh, Mithaq, a contract that also at times translated as, as also covenant, and confirm the details of, of this concept of covenant in the Quran, which is different from chosenness. This covenant means, whether Israelite or non-Israelite, means the, our duties toward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's nothing to do with this concept of chosenness. It's a consequence of just following the prophets. In the case of the Israelites, they were chosen, so they had the prophets, uh, chosen for the prophets to, um, to host the prophets, to appear for the prophets to appear amongst them. Uh, and then, as a result, they inherited their uh, scripture, teachings, so they also uh, became um, kind of the ad, the, the covenant then was for them to follow, to follow these teachings, to support the messengers, not to kill them. Uh, 
Um, and uh, so the Quran talks about uh, this concept of covenant uh, as being what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala requires of us uh, as applicable to everybody, not only the Israelites. <clears throat> Thank you very much for listening. Wassalatu wassalam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ali wa sahbi wa sallim taslima. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.